to say that we are, we are in unusual times, at least for us, would be an understatement. I'm sure others have experienced some of the things that we are experiencing now, but at different times and on in different levels. When I think of what's happening, it's good to know that uh, we are not alone and that God is the one that can help us. The stress level in our nation, according to um, the uh, American Psychological Assistance Study, as of March 2022, they say more people today are worried and expressing and experiencing stress than in any time in our history. One journal said that 75 to 90 percent of all the healthcare visits that's happening are connected in some way and are stress related in, to some degree. That uh, 45 percent of college students are going and getting counsel right now for stress. That six out of 10 high school students are experiencing a high level of stress. They talked about uh, the reasons, and you know, it could be as, as, as simple as what's going on financially in our world, what's happening uh, in, uh, in the Ukraine with the, uh, in Ukraine with the, uh, uh, with the war and, and just other types of things that have, that are taking, taking place. Uh, uh, you don't have to uh, have a, a, a degree to realize that gas has gone out of sight. Uh, it is, uh, in, in 19, uh, excuse me, in 2019, it was $2 and 50 cents a gallon. In 2020, it was two dollars and fifteen cents a gallon. In 2021, it was two dollars and ninety cents a gallon. And today, if you happen to look at it, it's about four dollars and thirty cents a gallon. Uh, and so, in just a couple years, what you could use to fill up your car for uh, twenty-one dollars has moved to twenty-nine dollars for ten gallons, and now it costs you forty-three dollars for ten gallons. That's enough to cause anybody a little stress. You know what I'm saying there? It's, you know, I, I get this, I have this app, you know, on where the cheapest gas is, and the cheapest gas was about 50 miles away, and I had to measure to say, is it worth it to drive and use four gallons of gas to get it cheaper? If you know what I, if you know what I mean. But it's good to know. And I was reminded that I went to the dermatologist, uh, dermatologist a little while back, and my hands were peeling. And the doctor said, you know, he said, well, you know, do you have a stressful job? And I said, no, I'm a pastor. I relieve stress. You know what I'm saying? Do I have a stressful job? Yeah, well, no, not really. But Jesus gives this invitation, though, that we are so familiar with that, that I just want us to, to, to have in our hearts this morning. Because he said, come unto me, he says in Matthew. You know these words. All of you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. I mean, what an invitation. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I'm gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest to your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That very statement, that very statement is really expanded on the Sermon on the Mount, in the Sermon on the Mount. Because what we know is this. God's blessing that he talks about in Matthew chapter 5 and also in Luke chapter 6, carries the highest level of fulfillment possible. We know what God has promised. In the verse we'll look at in just a few moments, it says, blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, and it says, they shall be filled. The word there means satisfied. Actually, the word means saturated. Those that hunger after God are going to be saturated by him. 
in May, we say, Lord, help us. Sometime in high school, you were, you were probably uh, uh, brought out or saw writing, had to read uh, some of the statements of the United States Declaration of Independence. This is how it was finally modified. It says, we hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. That they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable, inalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We as believers know that true contentment, true peace, true happiness, true joy, true bliss, as that word can be interpreted, interpreted, comes from the Lord, from his will, and from his kingdom. And the Sermon on the Mount describes his kingdom. It is in God's kingdom that we find contentment. It is in God's kingdom that we find joy. It is in God's kingdom that we find real happiness. Let me read the verses that we have been looking at over these last number of weeks. It says in Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse number 1, now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up into the mountainside and sat down, and his disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, and he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are they that mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And blessed are they, are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. The Beatitudes, again, are a progression. One goes to the other, to the other, to the other. And when we're reading this, we, we have been mentioning, and when we closed our message the last time, we said, blessed are the humble, blessed are the broken, and blessed are the surrendered. It's that attitude of being poor in spirit, mourning over our condition, and understanding that we can do nothing in ourselves, but if we surrender in meekness, we will win. In fact, I summarized them in three different words as I was thinking on it this morning or this week. I said, blessed, he said, blessed are the broke, those who realize that they are broke. Now, I'm, we're not talking physical broke, financially broke, that some of us might be in that, but it's really spiritually broke. I've had it. I've had it. Blessed are those. Jesus says, come unto me, all of you who have had it. And then those who are broken, they, they, we realize that, that not only we're, bro we're broken, we can't fix ourselves. We mourn in that condition. I can't help myself. Only God can help me. And then we bow. We surrender. We surrender. Oftentimes when we think of surrender, we think that when we surrender, we lose. And so we resist surrendering. But in God's kingdom, those who surrender win now and win later. And the question that, that we have to ask ourselves, you know, are, are, we, are we willing to surrender and continually surrender to him? All the blessings of God are based on promises that he's made. If you will, I will. Those who do this. And not only that, he gives us the power to do it. To surrender to him. Seek ye first, it says, at the end of chapter 6. And we will consider that in days to come, we trust. But seek first the kingdom, his will, his ways. His right ways. And all these things will be added unto us. Our responsibility is to cooperate. To cooperate. Our life starts and is sustained by him. The question, 
The question, are we cooperating with him? Church this morning, please. We can save ourselves a lot of grief if we'll just cooperate with God. Just cooperate with him. Surrender to him. May we quit fighting it, that, the very thing that God wants to do inside of us right now. Some of you in this room, all of us in this room to some degree, but there's some of us in this room at this very moment, you just need to say, I surrender. I surrender, God. I'm done fighting. And when you do that, the blessing of God comes your way. Our resistance, our lack of surrender is keeping what he wants to give to us. And so can we cooperate? Can we cooperate? God wants so much to do in us. But we stiff arm him. Even as believers, we stiff arm God. We think somehow he's going to hold back on us. Somehow, he who has given us all things is going to hold back on us. Heaven, heaven forbid. Heaven forbid. Well, let's look at this attitude. This one for this morning. Because when somebody realizes that they're poor, broken, broke and broken, and they realize they, 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 they need to surrender. They need to bow before God. What they're asking for is this. They're saying, God, I'm not right. And I know I'm not right. Would you make me right? I can't fix myself. Will you fix me? Will you do that? And this is what they're asking for. I mean, it, it is a, it's a desperation cry. Lord, I come hungering. Those words are strong words. It, it's, it's not like what we are right now. We're thinking about, hmm, what am I going to eat later? You know what I'm saying? Hmm, hmm, what am I going to eat? Do I have anything? Some of you have a sandwich in your purse. Uh, so uh, some of you bring something with you. And, you know, bless you. I understand um, I might call on that someday when I need it, okay? That, that, that banana you got in your purse, you know, Hazel, I might need it. Uh, but we, we hunger. We need to, it's, it's a desperation hunger. It's a starvation hunger. It's a, it's a thirst that, that, is, that is so desperate. And that drives us to God. We... We are so thirsty, God. I, it is that kind of, of, of approach to God. I'm broke. I'm busted. I don't have it. I surrender, God. I can't fix myself. I'm tired of the fight, God. Fix me. Fix me. When we get to that point, he says, come here. Come here. And in a moment's time, he begins to do something in us that changes not only the moment, but our forever. And he keeps doing that in us because we, we are stubborn people. No wonder God calls us sheep. He just, just wonder, Psst, get back here, get back here. He pulls us, pulls us. You know, I have come to the conclusion, you know, in the fasting that I've done in my life, I've never had to be hungry. You know, relatively speaking, I've told you about the times I ate sugar and mustard sandwiches. But, you know, that was only temporary and then food came. Um, but, you know, when I chose not to eat, when I chose to fast, when I chose I wouldn't have anything to eat for almost two weeks, just drink water, and then... And then uh, there was a time when I just chose not to have any food for 40 days. And you know, the highest craving that I had was for salt. I, man, I wanted salt. I would take a salt shaker, 
lick my hand and put salt on there and lick the salt off. I, I was driven for salt. I, don't tell anybody, okay? I didn't even want whipped cream, okay? <laughs> I, salt. I wanted salt, salt, salt. But I remember, I remember when I was a young pastor, couldn't have been more than 25, 26 years of age, and, and I was careless and I shouldn't have done this. But I went without food and water for three days. And I remember the third night, I was in such pain. I cried myself to sleep. But I remember as a young man, saying, I would rather die and not see God in my life. That's pretty desperate, pretty foolish too. I shouldn't have done that. That's not the way you do it. But there comes times in people's lives. But there did in my life. That I was desperate. I didn't have the answers. Still don't. And there's safer ways to express yourself. But when you're desperate, there is a thirst, there's a hunger to say, God, I can't fix this. I can't fix me. I can't fix these people. I can't fix this church. I can't fix anything. When we get to that kind of point, God can move. We surrender to him and he can work in our life. Listen, the people in Jesus' day, they understood hunger. I mean, they they understood it because there were some of those that had to work every day just to eat. If they don't work, they don't get to eat that day. They don't get to eat that day. And so when Jesus talked about this, they understood that much more perhaps than what we may, most of us, for that matter. But let's look at this this definition of what what it is that we're longing for. It's a desperate definition, or excuse me, a, a, a desperate longing for the righteousness that only God can bring. I, God, I'm not right. I'm not right with you and I'm not right with this world. I am broke. I am empty. I have nothing to offer. I surrender to you. Fix me, God. Please fix me. And God is the one who is able to do that. He will make us right so that we can live right. It is that craving to be made right. There's something inside of us that grows to the point that we say, God, I realize I'm poor in spirit. I have nothing to offer. I mourn because I'm in that condition. I surrender to you. Please make me right. That's what the Sermon on the Mount is saying. Please make me right. Get get me in right place with you. I'm out of place with you positionally, God. Put me where I'm supposed to be. Put me where I'm supposed to be. Boy, what a difference that makes. (laughs) I am a child of God. I am a child of God. He put me there. We stand with that. I am. I am a child of God. We've fallen short of honoring God. We're, we've fallen short of treating each other right. And we long to be returned to that. And it's a continued desire. God, continue to work. Continue to change us. Continue to change me. Continue to do that. And in Luke's account of this particular verse, uh, he adds the word now. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst now. Are we, am I, hungering and thirsting now? Now. I did when I was 27. I did it when I was 41. Am I as hungry for God at 72 as I was then? Am I hungering for him now? 
Am I desperate for him now? Taunting. Because I need him more than ever. And he promises. The promise is, those that hunger and thirst will. Will be fully satisfied and saturated. It's funny, but it's true. Cheesecake Factory beat me with whipped cream. No place, nowhere in this world in 70 years, I probably started liking it when I was eight or nine, 62 years, could anybody satisfy me? They did. They won. They won. They won. I, was, I wasn't up to here. I was, they won. They put me under the table. You know what that does for me? With that, I, I compare that. I compare. God, bear with the, the you know, comparison. But God puts us under the table. I mean, you go to the banquet and you can go back and you can go back and to go back. We love to buffet our bodies. Not buffet. But the idea here, it, it's, it, it's a term of feeding, of feeding animals that they would get all that they wanted. All, they were full. Will I ever be full? God, will I really ever be full? What is it going to take? And God says, come here, grasshopper. I'll fill you. I will fill you. And we all can talk about times. I can take you to a church where I roll on the floor. I was a holy roller that night. But I got filled. I got filled. You can take to moments when you got filled. Filled. Talk a little bit like from Kentucky or something. <laughs> and not Michigan. <laughs> um, you have to love me though because I was born in Arkansas. You know, it's... it's But this is what I've learned. I learned that God rewards hunger with more hunger. The fullest spiritual people that I know want more. It's almost as if my can container is this big and he fills it up and then he says, all right, I'm going to give you a bigger container. I got more, but I got more hunger. I got more God, I got more hunger. He keeps filling us up. Amen. Yes. Yes. If there's anybody on the planet that knew God in his lifetime, it was the Apostle Paul. He knew God. He knew God. And the cry of his heart probably five years before he was martyred. When he's writing the book of Philippians, he writes from a jail cell, he writes, I want to know him more. I want to know him more. I would say, Paul, excuse me. You've, you've seen it and experienced it all. You're the only person I know that hell knows you by first name. And you want more? Yeah. Our 
our challenge is what's our hunger level for this morning? One way that a person wrote this verse, and I thought it was good, and uh, let me uh, bring this to a close. Oh, the blessings of the man who longs for total righteousness as a starving man longs for food and a man perishing of thirst longs for water. For that man will be truly satisfied. Psalms 107 says this in verse number 9. He satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. And actually it should be Psalms 42.2. It says, my soul thirsts for God, the living God. And in Psalm 63.1, it says, my soul thirsts for you. Early I will seek you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land. And in Psalms 104, 143, 6, it says, My soul longs for you like a thirsty land. God will fill those. So let's just conclude this with a question. What are we hungering and thirsting for? What am I hungering, thirsting for? I understand that often that a sign of physical health and you're getting better is an appetite. And most of us don't have to worry about a good appetite. (laughs) But it's also a sign of spiritual health that we're hungry for God. Hungry for God. See, righteousness is to be experienced and it's to be seen. Because not only does it put ourselves in the right place with God, It helps us to live a life that other people are affected by and seen. I want to, I want to be, we want to be the person you want us to be. And we want it to show. Oftentimes you've seen the sticker and if you have one, that's fine, but be patient with me. You know, God isn't finished yet, you know, and, um, I, I've never been attracted to that sticker. If you got one, that's okay. You know, you know I'll just honk at you and love you. Um, but I always thought that we should get a sticker that says, I'm a Christian. Let me know if it doesn't show. Ooh. As you're beeping and shaking your fist, you know. <laughs> I've told you that God had to deal with me because, you know, I, I wouldn't do anything like that because I'm a pastor. You know, it doesn't mean I didn't think it, though, you know what I'm saying? But if somebody cut out in front of me, I would just turn my head and look down and say, I'm sorry that I have to live with people like you in this world. Go ahead. Get out of my way. Just go on. I won't, I won't look at you. I'll tolerate you. I understand there's people like you. Go ahead. Go ahead. And I mean, God had to convict me. That's pride. That's arrogance. That is ar- that's ugly. And I'm thinking I'm being spiritual. God says, you only kidding yourself. And I say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed and full are those who possess this attitude. Hey, let's be blessed. Okay? Let's be blessed. 